We live in weird times, I'm sure you agree, and that weirdness shows no signs of going away, but in this episode, me and my guest Cara Healy, among other things, talked about the question of whether fiction can help us get ready for the weirdness as it arrives, as it washes up on the shore, uh, wave by wave, or as it, you know, multiplies and grows and we become even more enmeshed in this world that we're stuck in and this world which so often seems to be just going to pot. How can you represent that in fiction and what can fiction do for you as someone living in this crazy world? It's pretty relevant to the book that we're doing for this episode. It's The Man with Compound Eyes by Wu Ming Yi. It's the third in our Taiwan season that we've been doing on this podcast and it's kind of a sci-fi book, kind of not, which makes it of particular interest to me because I've done an awful lot of sci-fi on this podcast, but it's all been from the Chinese mainland, and now we've uh, we've leapt off the mainland into the Republic of Taiwan, or the Republic of China, which is Taiwan. Anyway, enough silliness, let's get on with the show. So first, before we launch into the interview, we've got the Churchific News, the translated Chinese fiction news, and all three of my news items today are new books that have come out. So. I'm going to be very lazy and just read you guys the blurbs for the books. So the first one is The Secret Talker by Guling Yan. Also, you, you may know her as uh, Yan Guling. And this is translated by former show guest Jeremy Tiang. So of course I'm biased. So here is the blurb for the book. It's a fairly long blurb, so I might be naughty and skip some of it, but here we go. A woman reclaims her own story in this taut, wholly original literary tale from one of China's literary superstars. Hong Mei is the perfect Chinese wife, beautiful, diligent, passive. Glenn is the perfect American husband, intelligent, caring, well off. From the outside, Hong Mei and Glenn's life in the San Francisco Bay Area seems perfect, but at home, their marriage is falling apart. Post-its left on the fridge are their primary form of communication. When Hong Mei receives a beguiling email from a secret admirer, Naturally, she's intrigued. But what starts out as harmless flirting with an internet stranger quickly turns into an all-consuming emotional affair. As Hong Mei spills more and more about her dark past as a military intelligence officer in training in China, she falls deeper and deeper into a tense cat and mouse game. Desperate and self-destructive, she embarks on an investigation into her emailer's, emailer's secret history, one that may tear her life and marriage apart forever. A psychological story at its core, the secret talker elegantly examines how repressed desire and simmering silence can upend even the most idyllic marriage. As Hong Mei pursues her stalker, her identity and agency come into question, and the chase curveballs into a captivating journey of self-actualization. Yang Guoling pierces the human psyche to reveal devastating and emotional truths and ending, and an ending that will leave readers speechless. Nice. Next one, this is a little bit more relevant to the Taiwan season I've been doing. So the first two episodes of said Taiwan season were both uh, queer uh, stories. Yes, queer stories from uh, queer authors. And here we have just the book, um, if you guys were into those episodes. So this is Queer Chinese Literature, a Reader by Howard Chiang. And I believe this is translated by Daryl Stark. But anyway, I'll just get on and read this, read this blurb. Since the lifting of martial law in 1987, queer authors have redefined Taiwan's cultural scene, and throughout the 1990s, many of their works won the most prestigious literary awards and accolades. This anthology provides a deeper understanding of queer literary history in Taiwan. It includes a collection of short st- a selection, sorry, a selection of short stories previously untranslated, written by Taiwanese authors dating from 1975 to 2020. Readers are introduced to a wide range of themes bisexuality, aging, mobility, diaspora, AIDS, indigeneity, I'm glad I pronounced that correctly, recreational drug use, transgender identity, surrogacy, and many others. The diversity of literary tropes and styles canvassed in this book reflects the profusion of gender and sexual configurations that has marked Taiwan's complex history for the past half century. Uh, It's 248 pages long as well, so it's not a monster that you'll never finish. Next up, this is a slightly different link I'm using. This is the uh, reading club or the book review um, club or whatever you'd like to call it that the um, lead center for new Chinese writing runs. And the book they've just covered is not hot off the presses. It's from 2018. It's The Rainbow of Time by Jimmy Liao and it's uh, translated by Wang Xinlin, Xinlin and Andrea Lingenfelter. That is a fun surname, Lingenfelter. Anyway. Hopefully she's not listening. The blurb for this one is a little bit shorter. 
Her mother's departure marks the beginning of a lonely young girl's lifelong love affair with the world of film. One day, she encounters a boy. In parting, they promise each other, no matter what happens in future, they will meet again in the movie theatre. Set against the timeless backdrop of classic and familiar European films, so begins the story of three generations of love, loss and faith that will thrust one girl from childhood into the heart of womanhood. As she soon discovers, real life is often far more poignant than the movies. With full-page illustrations from one of Taiwan's most evocative and popular illustrators, The Rainbow of Time is a stunning tribute to the power of love, faith and the redemptive magic of films. And if you're curious about people's takes on the book, well, the Leeds uh, Centre has got up ooh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 different reviews by different readers. Um, one's from friend of the show, Michelle Dieter, um, and others are from... People I don't know, but whose opinions I'm sure are totally relevant. I'm seeing this, this is in fact not the most recent book in their um, book club. These reviews are all from a few years ago, but they shared this one on Twitter because cinemas in the UK are about to reopen, and I guess this book's all about the magic of cinema. So yeah, if you're looking forward to getting back to the cinema, here's a book you should go pick up. So yeah, another piece of church fake news that's not strictly news, but whatever, I don't care. That is the end of our news segment, so let's let's um, let's hear less of me. We'll cut ourselves down to about 50% me, and we can hear from our guest for the show, Kari Healy. Okay, so on the show we have Kara Healy to talk about the man with the compound eyes. Hi Kara, how's it going, and um, what have you been up to lately? Hi, Angus. Thank you so much for having me. It's really great to be here. I'm doing well, enjoying the sunny spring weather here. How have you been? Um, pretty good. It's been interesting times over here in Dundee. Um, yesterday, so we're recording on the 25th of April. Yesterday, I was on a panel um, with a load of people who are much bigger superstars than me talking about um, Chinese science fiction with the uh, essence of wonder. So I'm sort of in the zone for, for this book we're going to talk about today. And I'm in the zone for talking at length into the microphone about tricky subjects. So I'm, I'm good. I'm feeling like I've had a coffee, which, which I have. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. So before we start talking about the book itself, Cara, can you tell the listeners a wee bit about yourself and what your connection is with to, uh, to the man with the compound eyes? Sure. So um, I'm assistant professor of Chinese and Asian studies at Wabash College in Indiana in the U.S., and um, my research focuses on Chinese science fiction. And so it, I'm looking at situating Chinese sci-fi both in relation to Chinese literary traditions, but also to global science fiction. And so I like to approach um, Chinese sci-fi from the perspective of generic hybridity. So thinking about all the ways that Chinese sci-fi combines, subverts, and reinterprets conventions of various other genres. Um, and um, I'm also a literary translator. That's a little bit about me in terms of this book. Um, so I wrote my dissertation on Chinese and Sinophone science fiction. And so this was one of the um, works that I address. I actually wrote about it in a chapter comparing it with um, Chen Chiofan's Waste Tide. Perfect. And a lot of similarities. Yeah, um, I think we're going to get onto that particular connection probably more than once throughout the course of the interview. But yeah, um, Again, still creeping up on talking about the actual book, let's talk about the author first, uh, Mr. Wu Ming Yi. So it's also worth mentioning here. So the Ming Yi, that's got a little, when we write it in English, it's got a little dash between it, which to the canny China watcher will tell them this is a Taiwanese person and this is Taiwanese literature, I suppose, um, but written in Chinese. And the version we're talking about is the English translation. But yeah, um, <laughs> getting back to the question, who is Wu Ming Yi, uh, both as a person and as a figure on the literary landscape. And I suppose here it might be worth considering whether it's better to think about the Taiwanese literary, la literary landscape or the Sinophone literary landscape or whatever. I, I really don't know. That's why I'm asking you. Right. So Wu Ming Yi was born in Taiwan in 1971, and he's an author, but also a, prof a professor of literature and creative writing and an environmental activist. So he's written a number of novels, I think, um, like maybe around five or six novels. And he's also written a number of essay collections on nature writing, um, kind of nonfiction. 
And the man with the compound eye, um, he wrote in 2011, and it was translated into English by Daryl Sterk in 2013. And this was Wu Mingyi's first novel that was translated into English. And um, it kind of brought him onto the international literary scene. Um, since then, he has another novel out in English translation, The Stolen Bicycle, um, also translated by Daryl Sterk. Um, and that one, um, that book, I think, talks about kind of uh, World War II era history. And it was nominated for the Man Booker International Prize in 2018, which, again, just kind of shows the um, kind of literary clout that Wu Mingyi is um, has, has been gaining on the international, um, on the international literary scene. And actually there was thinking about in terms of identity, right? This is always a complicated question, especially with Taiwan. Um, there was a big kind of to do at some point when they announced the, the long list for the Man Booker Prize and they listed it as coming from Taiwan and then People got upset and they kind of waffled back, listing it as part of Taiwan, China. And then more people got upset and they went back to listing it as from Taiwan. So this is, I think that these are the kind of issues that frequently come up when we're thinking about literature, but also film or any other kind of cultural production um, where Taiwan is entering on the international stage, right? This kind of question of how do we talk about it in a way that recognizes the complicated political situation, but also recognizes the individuality and subjectivity that's been developing unique to Taiwan, to Taiwan and Taiwanese literature. Um, you mentioned, I guess, I, maybe I brought the term up, I, I brought up the term Sinophone and you were asking about that. Yeah. I think that's a, a useful way of thinking about Chinese literature in the sense that for a long time, I think Chinese literature meant literature from mainland China, but there's, you know, a wealth of writing in Chinese um, from writers, you know, across Taiwan and Hong Kong and um, Singapore, Malaysia, and also um, other diaspora populations. Um, and so, um, you know, literary scholars have been really developing over the past decade or so, this idea of the Sinophone, um, this idea of writing in Chinese, but not necessarily bound to mainland China. Again, thinking about Francophone, Hispanophone, right? This is in that same vein. Mm. And so that I think is a useful framework to think about, to think about, to give us a broader idea of, you know, Chinese language literature, um, but also again, like different writers might identify differently as Taiwanese or as Chinese or diasporic Chinese American, um, right, is just depending on their own take. So it can be a useful lens, but I don't think it's necessarily the only way we can conceive of this novel or any novel. For sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we are finally, this is the first time on the show that we've really gone into the word Sinophone. It's popped up a few times uh, when I think often when I've asked guests to uh, recommend some books and they've there's we've had some recommendations, I think, from like... Uh, yeah, writers who are writing in Chinese and they're Malaysian Chinese or Taiwanese or something. So it's something that appropriately enough has sort of, sort of been on the periphery of, of this show, but now we're finally getting into it. So that's great. Um, zooming in a wee bit, where exactly does the man with the compound eyes sit in Wu Meng Yi's sort of like his bibliography or his list of works? Is this a really typical Wu Ming Yi, Wu, blah, 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 a really typical Wu Ming Yi book or is it something a bit different from him? Um, I think that like thematically the focus on um, nature writing is something that shows up um, in a lot of his work. So in that sense, I think that it's kind of questions of the relationship between humanity and our environment is definitely a theme that comes up a lot. Right. It's an interesting thing. Though, the things that when an author exists in translation, the things that can sort of be hidden, the sort of, um, what's the word, the obscured like snapshot you get. So the two books you can, if you go searching in English, the two books you'll find is this and The Bicycle Thief. And they seem quite different really, apart from maybe both having some sort of high literary value but yeah once once you look into the man himself um yeah it sort of it, it makes more sense in in context there was something i was actually wanting to say to, to rewind slightly talking about um 
Sinophone literature as a category and tying that back to that the Essence of Wonder panel I mentioned having been in, uh, that was partly set up by Yin Wei, and she was kind of linking that to an issue of Vector, which is the magazine of the British Science Fiction Association. She and Regina Kanye Wang were uh, involved in putting that together. And there was a section in there where they had like um, sort of little snippet inputs from all these academics working in, I guess, the field of Chinese literature studies. The biggest sort of celeb, well, celebrity in there was David uh, Doorway Wang. And the thing he wanted to stress about science fi- Chinese science fiction is that um, a lot of the time this term is used to describe stuff from the mainland, like the, the sort of the new wave. So everything from like Liu Cixin and his cohort onwards, but it's not, you know, not, not in a na- deliberately nasty way, but it has sort of excluded sci-fi written in Chinese from other places. Um, so he wanted to stress like the existence of Sinophone Chinese sci-fi from like Taiwan, Hong Kong. He was even uh, suggesting a word Xenophone. I don't, I don't really remember why he, he used that, but it sounded appropriately sort of science fiction-y. Um, so it, again, it's, it's nice to be linking those two things together because now we're doing not just some sinophone literature but some sinophone sci-fi it's pretty cool i don't know that's not really a question is there anything you could say to that or shall we just march on and talk about the book um so i guess one thing i'll say maybe this gets a little bit to one of your later questions i'm jumping ahead thinking about the relation between this book and um chinese you know kind of the new wave of mainland chinese science fiction that's been getting a lot of publicity Mm. and um i mentioned before that i you know see a lot of similarities thematically between this book and chen jiu fan's the waste tile we can get into that maybe in a little bit a little bit later but on this subject of kind of sinophone science fiction i will say that so if you think about the if you think about the new wave that's been coming out of the mainland there's a pretty it's, you know, it's still relatively new, right, in the past 10 years or so that this has really crystallized. Mm. But there's a pretty, already a pretty sophisticated network of authors and translators and academics and fans and editors and literary magazines and literary prizes, right? There's this whole network surrounding the Chinese science fiction scene in, um, you know, in mainland China, the same way that we see this, you know, in in, you know, I mean, in other countries as well, right? So in the US and the UK. And I think that mainland Chinese science fiction has really effectively kind of had a lot of cross pollination between those two, I guess, sets of infrastructure, right? So, you know, Chinese science fiction is really active at Worldcon and with the Hugo Award for the Ocean. So there's been a lot of I guess, like interaction behind the scenes, right? Not just in terms of the text themselves, but all this kind of extra textual um, literary production, consumption, circulation. And I think at least I can, I think I can pretty confidently say that for this novel and for Wu Mingyi's novels aren't really, they're not really in those operating in those same circles. They're not necessarily participating in that particular kind of system of, distribution and circulation. Um, But what I will say is that as Chinese sci-fi from the mainland has become more popular, there has been this increased interest, as you were mentioning, um, that David Wang Zouwei was kind of referencing in the journal, this interest in Chinese sci-fi from the Sinophone world, um, both very, you know, um, contemporary things, contemporary writings, the writings by authors like, you know, Cheng Guangzhong and Ego Yan Zhang, Ego Yan, and Loi Jun, um, and then also from looking back at some of the older works as well. So by authors like Mi Kuang from Hong Kong and um, Zhang Xiguo from Taiwan. So there's been kind of a, a um, there's been the interest, I would say at least in academic circles, there's been an overlap. And, you know, I've interacted with some of these, uh, some of these other authors have been kind of in conversation with the mainland Chinese authors. So just mm. this, earlier this week, I saw a panel um, that Harvard and Wellesley were hosting and they had a few mainland Chinese writers and also um, Yi Geoyan, Yi Geoyan Zheng from Taiwan as well in dialogue. So there's definitely been more interaction and more cross-pollination between these different literary circles, I guess. But as far as I know, Wu Mingyi's writing 
Arabes uh, Wumingi and his and his writing is kind of somewhat outside of this um, these interactions at the moment, and so we'll see what happens. I also know that it's you can even kind of tell from the types of literary awards that he's been nominated for that it seems like this is maybe his work is being positioned at least globally as more on the you know literary with a capital L um, yeah. you know serious literature which I think is a really problematic distinction because of course science fiction genre fiction is doing can be very serious and artistic and do all kinds of really valuable interesting things um, and so I'm not really sure what Wu Mingyi's take would be on this right I don't know but I think that if we're just looking at the way that these books have been marketed or the way that people are talking about them in academic circles or whatnot or circles of literary like literary prize networks and mm. kind of the larger literary scene I guess right literary communities maybe right if I can put it in really crass terms people who devour science fiction and fantasy are you know are often called nerds but people who devour literary fiction I think they're nerds too so we need a bit of nerd cross-pollination and solidarity, solidarity. totally yeah. nerd solidarity yeah. I mean now that we're all live online now's now's the time really for the nerds to absolutely I think they've already taken over but to absolutely consolidate and cross-pollinate their hold on on literature now's totally the time right let's talk about the actual book um I'll try and stop being silly um first questions about the just the plot of the book, because I've noticed in some past episodes, I've just not talked enough about the plot. And for the poor listeners listening who've not read the thing, you know, we have to do them a favor. Um, and this is like, uh, in some ways, I think quite pl the plot and the events are pretty important. But on other hands, I felt like it's not a very heavily plotted book. I don't know what, what your feelings about that are. But I think first, we should just try and summarize what happens. Um, I mean, we can do this two ways. I could have a go and you could fill in anything I've missed or we could do it vice versa um but you've done the dissertation on the book would you like to try and summarize the plot would that be sure all right sure cool. I'll, I'll give it a shot okay so the book centers around the pacific trash vortex which is this kind of conglomeration or an artificial island it's conceptualized in the book of plastic waste floating in the pacific ocean and there are two main characters, I think it's fair to say. You have Alice and Atle. So Alice is a professor. Um, she lives alone in a Taiwanese coastal town, and she's grieving the loss of her husband and her son. She's in a really dark place at the beginning of the novel. And the, our second main character, Atle, uh, grew, he, he's a 15-year-old boy who grew up among an isolated primitive society on a fictional Pacific Islands called Wayo Wayo. And so since he's the second son in his family, he's banished from the island at the age of 15 in a ritual that is designed to, I guess, control the island's population. Um, but instead of perishing at sea, as would be expected, Atle crashes into the specific trash vortex and he starts survive. He's able to live on this plastic island um, until eventually it collides into Taiwan's coast. And, you know, kind of in the midst of this um, ecological catastrophe um, that's, you know, literally pummeling the shores of Taiwan, Alice discovers uh, Atle on the beach. He's injured and she um, kind of, she tends to him and um, helps him. Um, she takes care of him and the two form an unlikely friendship and they start exchanging their stories and, that le and it leads to healing, I think, for both of them. So that's maybe kind of like the um, quick, quick summary of the book, but there's a lot more going on. Yeah, a couple of things I'll add. I think one of them, you, you more or less said it, but I'll spell it out more explicitly. There are sort of, the book is, a lot of it is not, it's not too speculative or fantastic. A lot of it's quite real, but some things are sort of like amplified or speculative, speculative fictionified. So um, the, like the Wild Wild, uh, I forgot. Wild Wild is the, is that the tribe or the island? Is it the tribe? I think it's the island. And right. also they refer to themselves as the Wild Wild. That is in the translation. That's how okay. Star it. does it. Right. So yeah, the Wild Wild, that's something that Wu Mingyi has created. 
I did yes. a little looking ju- just on Wikipedia because um, they're they're an uncon- uncontacted tribe out there in the Pacific. It seems like most of the world's actual uncont- uncont- uncontacted tribes are not really so much in the Pacific. They're in like uh, around Indies- Indonesia, possibly a few in Africa, and then almost half of them are in the rainforest. There's that really famous one in the Indian Ocean who live on the Sentinel Islands. So they're they're a fictional creation, but a really really um, he's put a lot of kind of effort into creating a quite immersive culture for them. They're a quite impressive literary creation. Um, so there's that the island that Atle Atlai um, lands on in real life. It's there, but you would just step right through it. It's not something that would right. your weight. And it's maybe, I don't know how high it rises off the ocean, maybe not at all, but it's a thing that he can literally like sort of jump onto and camp out on, which is, um, you know, it's it's taking the the, the, the truth and sort of, um, there's, there's, a, there's a really good verb here and I can't think what it is. Stretching it a bit? Stretching it. Um, no, it's not going to come to me. Literalizing it. Yeah, yeah, amplifying it. Um, it's it's not going to come to me. But yeah, he he does he does what a writer does. He does something sort of. He he takes the um he takes the sort of um uh, no, it's not it's really not going to come to me. But yeah, that's a slight exaggeration. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that although we we are on Taiwan for most of the book, and one of our lead characters, Alice, she's Taiwanese. So she's a Han Chinese Taiwanese person. Just about the rest of the cast are either the Wai Wai Islanders or they're um, the indigenous people of Taiwan. Who I double checked this to make sure, but the uh, the the indigenous people of Taiwan are sort of. Can I correct me if I'm wrong here? They're sort of of Polynesian descent. So they would be. I mean, if we're being, if I'm being extremely biological here they would probably be in the great human family tree a little closer to Atala or a lot closer to Atala than, than Alice. So I wondered if, if that was, if there was something that Wu Mingyi was trying to do there, or if it's just sort of circumstantial. I was, I was going to say we can get onto that later, but my next question is about the characters. So I'll just ask you, do you think it's significant that the indigenous Taiwanese characters are so numerous and important and this is also a book where we have um, uh, a character from the Pacific, Atalai, being one of the two leads. Do you think that's something that's important? I do. I think it's very important. So um, as you kind of alluded to, the novel has really an ensemble cast of characters and the chapters kind of alternate from different characters' point of view. It's constantly jumping around. You're in different characters. You're close to different characters. And so... Uh, a number of the characters are indigenous Taiwanese. Um, so I think the two main ones we see the most of are Hafei and Dahu, who are Alice's friends and neighbors. They're um, like Panka and Bunun, respectively. Um, and those are their um, ethnicities. And um, then we also, like you said, we also have the Waiowaiowin characters. I think the probably the main one besides Atle is Rasala, his lover. Um, from Wild Wild, who actually ends up going on a journey to find him. Um, and I do think, and, and, it, and there's actually also a couple of Western scientist characters that pop up yep. as well, a few mm-hmm. international characters. Yep. Um, and I do think that it's significant that he's, that Wu Mingyi is bringing in these, like, I guess, different kind of iteration. He's playing on this theme of the, you know, of indigeneity in different different iterations so what I think is really interesting is that he has this ensemble cast of characters and he's drawing parallels between them in very I think in very deliberate ways if you just look at the way that the chap the way the chapters are structured the chapter titles there's that there's parallels between Alice and Atle interestingly enough even though it seems like a very unlikely parallel but if you think about if you look at the chapters, you have Alice's last night and Atelier's last night, Alice's island and Atelier's island. And this relationship between them, their stories have a lot of parallels, kind of blurring the lines in a very sh- odd way between parental and romantic connections. Um, and if you look at kind of the type of grief that they're both dealing with, I think the novel's drawing some parallels there. But then also, I do think it is drawing parallels between the um Wyoyoan characters and the 
Taiwanese indigenous characters like Hafei and Daf and Dafu. You see similar things with the chapter titles that they're echoing one another or kind of presented in series. So I do think that the author is drawing our attention to those connections. Um, and I have some thoughts also about kind of the relationship between the Waiyoan characters and the indigenous Taiwanese characters, how they're positioned. That gets more into maybe your next question on genre as well. Interesting. So I see those things as quite connected. Oh, that's that's really cool. Yeah, I had a, f- a few responses to just statements and one question that probably doesn't have an answer. So you know, terrible interview techniques. But yeah, one of them is the sort of international and multi-ethnic cast with like um, big climate-based near future themes. That reminds me a lot of um, David Mitchell. I think other people have made this comparison. Yeah, Some of his sort of, and I guess, yeah, that sort of postmodern without being too in your face experimental sort of approach right. maybe as well those that's quite david mitchellian right. and it's so Corey burns who's another scholar of chinese literature um at northwestern he wrote a review of the translation when it came out and he also i think makes this connection to david mitchell which i can definitely see and he describes it as postmodern bricolage which is a really nice mm. way of putting it i think in terms of the characters the genre character the genre, the way it's playing with genre, the way that the story is coming together from all these um, diverse threads that eventually all coalesce. Yep, that's very, very Cloud Atlas. And actually, it's very every one of his books. Yeah, I think it helps as well that David Mitchell has a little bit of an East Asian connection or recurring presence in his own works himself. He uh, does, he does. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the other thing I was going to comment on was what you mentioned that the interesting relationship Alice and Atelier Atelier is that right I think so Atelier, right um Alice and Atelier have um where it's like it she's what she's 30 something or she early 40s about that something sort of like age. that and she's lost her husband and her 10 year old or so son and Atelier is something like 15 yeah um, but maybe he's a little bit of an a little bit of an early bloomer in some ways maybe just because of the 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 island he's grown up on and their relationship becomes mostly just a friendship but it's it gets peculiar because they're become like hints of a mother-son relationship but maybe also very gentle hints of maybe something more uh, intimate and i i like that it was never it never really got weird because Mm -hmm. i mean not, not to disparage mainland chinese fiction too much but sometimes some of the especially like the big name mainland Chinese authors, they won't just flirt with something, be a little bit, being a little bit gross or transgressive. They'll just go straight for it. And um, the sort of restraint, not making things uncomfortable, but also making them a little, almost like uncanny or bizarre. I kind of, I kind of like that. Um, the last thing I was going to say, this is the question I don't really think has an answer. Um, so you mentioned that there are some uh, Western characters and I noticed that they're all either, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they're all either from Norway, Denmark, or Germany. So there's a really strong like Northern European contingent in the book. Those are sort of the, the characters who are, who are the Westerners. They're all from like one quite small corner of the, the, the Western world. Like I, I strongly suspect that there's no real message there, but do you think there's anything we could say about that? Mm, I don't. I'm not really sure. I hadn't thought about it in those terms. As I was going back over the novel, I noticed that kind of when it's when there's the flashbacks to Alice's relationship with Tom, right? She meets him while she's traveling in Scandinavia. And it talks a lot about the architecture and how they're looking at diff they're kind of looking at different um different houses and different buildings and different designs. And that really inspires them to create their um you know their own um beach house in um mm. in haven and so i wonder if it's just something i have there's maybe just a um aesthetic connection in terms of that that was something that the author wanted to bring in that was that's something that that stood out to me um on this read through that i hadn't really thought about or hadn't noticed before but i don't know if there's any 
deeper meaning behind that or not? That would yeah. be a really interesting question to ask the author. Mm, yeah, my sort of just blowing hot air hot take might be that maybe there's some kind of a at least aesthetic connection there because and I think in a lot of the popular imagination maybe in my mind we think of Taiwan as being the slightly more forward thinking progressive sort of twin to the mainland China and then here in Europe um the Scandies are just the people who are they've got societies that are just that bit healthier that bit more this kind sane. of utopia this kind of utopian <laughs> imagining at least right yeah although i've heard that's to some extent a fantasy the countries have their own problems that was something of course yeah that was something that was sort of foregrounded in scotland a few years ago when the referendum was happening on scottish independence and there was a really good i think it was a bbc uh or possibly not documentary that had a look at each one of those countries and said you know are these really the utopias scotland could model itself on and being the BBC, to its credit, the answer was maybe yes, maybe no, um, right. <laughs> um, which is better than a hard answer on either side. But I think Scotland gets used in the same way um, by progressive English people. They'll talk about it like it's a progressive utopia and like, again, like yes and no. We're just another another country with our own problems. Um, right. I think the US talks about Canada in a similar, right. in a similar vein. Yeah, right. Um, I'm glad we solved that one. Uh, next question. <laughs> this is the this is the one that I think you've got a lot to say about. It's the genre question. So we were talking a lot about how this is a sci-fi book, but like I think that's pretty questionable in and of itself. Like when I was reading, I certainly was only occasionally getting the buzz I get from other sci-fi books I've read. Um, so the, just the risk of um, the risk of opening a a jar that we'll never be able to shut again. Can we actually apply genre labels to the book? Right. So um, I, so I guess my take on this is that it does have elements of sci-fi. It does have this kind of futuristic setting, this idea of it's, I think it's related a lot to these kind of, you know, climate fiction, eco-catastrophe, ecological dystopia vein of science fiction that we see, um, but there's also elements of magical realism and the fantastic and other types of speculative um, genres. And so I guess I would argue that the way that the author is kind of mashing together all these different speculative elements is actually very much contributes to the text's larger environmental message. So I think, I guess, one approach that I found really helpful for this book was um, so literary scholar Karen Thornber has a book out called Eco Ambiguity, which is all about, you know, I'm quoting her here, the complex contradictory interactions between people and environments with a significant non-human presence. So looking at all these contradictions between human and non-human natural um, interactions. And I think that maybe we can get into this, you know, um, going forward. But I would argue that the way that the novel is incorporating markers of these different speculative genres or speculative modes of writing um, is contributing to the way that it's portraying this ambiguous relationship between humans and nature, or also even thinking about um, the questions you were looking at, we were thinking about earlier in terms of the connections between the different indigenous characters, both you know, fictional and um, non-fictional indigenous groups, real indigenous groups. And so I think in particularly the way that the novel brings in elements of the fantastic and magical realism um, expands our understanding of what science fiction is or can be, right? Hmm. And did you think that all the sort of um, cramming in or inclusion of different sort of non-realist elements in an often quite realist book, just in like a a reader level do you think it works all the time or do you think it's sometimes a bit awkward I enjoyed it I think it works um I think if you um sit down and try to really p- pull out the different elements there's some there is like some rhyme or reason to it even though it initially seems very overwhelming I could say I guess maybe we could say right there's a lot going on here but I think um I guess this is getting a bit into what what was in my dissertation you were kind of alluding to in the next section. Um, So thinking about 
particularly like how the novel, how the author uses the fantastic and how the author uses magical realism. And we can get into kind of what I mean by those terms, what scholars, how scholars have used those terms and how I see it in the, in being used in the text. And then this also relates to your question about metafictionality. Mm. So like, and is anything metaf- metafictional going on um, in the novel? I would say definitely. And I think I see these things as all related. Okay, well, that's a good prompt. So we're going to leave the sort of surface level and we're going to, I don't know, dive beneath the ocean or drill into the mountain, go into the depths and start by talking about your thesis. So is your thesis, um, to put it really like bluntly, is it a critique of the book or is it a more positive evaluation or should I be, should I not be thinking in like these um, uh, positive and negative terms? Is that the wrong way of thinking about what you were doing? Well, I guess what I'm more interested in than thinking, I guess I say I'm, you know, I enjoyed the book a lot. Um, I mm. think there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of really interesting um, ideas showing up um, in this, in the story. I think it's a pretty fast read, um, even though it's quite complicated. Mm. Um, but I would say that I'm more interested in kind of what questions does the book prompt us to think about? what is the text doing how is it how is it bringing together these different themes how is it um, approaching questions of identity or questions of um, environmentalism so I'm more interested in those types of because what questions the book is posing and then what how can we use the text how could based on the text what kind of answers might the book be exploring or proposing even if it's not actually just giving you a direct um the book I think is more complicated than just saying this is the method of the book xyz we've we've done we've solved it right Mm -hmm. I with you know most good literature there's a lot of different ways you could interpret it and so I'm I guess in my writing I'm interested in those types of questions rather than just kind of looking at it as a, um, you know, positive or negative. And there's things I think it does that are really effective. There's things that maybe I have some questions about or that might have been less effective or might be problematic. But overall, I think I'm more interested in the questions themselves as opposed to kind of the assessment. Right. So what was what was the title of your thesis? So the, the title of the thesis was Genre Transgressions and Transnationalism in Chinese Science Fiction. But basically it's looking at kind of this idea of generic hybridity that I mentioned earlier is what a lot of my research focuses on. So looking at the way that um, uh, Chinese or Chinese language science fiction or science fiction adjacent texts maybe um, are incorporating elements of you know various speculative genres science fiction subgenres but also elements of um you know chinese literary genres as well anything from critical realism to some of the more pre-modern genres like um martial arts or you know uh, wuxia or elements from the kind of Guai, the tales of the strange mm. um right so lo- looking at a lot of these different literary traditions and how these new works are kind of drawing connections between these genres to do interesting things. So in the thesis as a whole, I draw a lot of connections with kind of this generic hybridity and then how the texts themselves are exploring themes of hybridity, whether that's, you know, cultural hybridity or human, non-human interactions um, or other types um, looking at national identity, right? these these types of questions so this so the chapter on the man with the compound eye was only one part of that and what genres did you see sort of making up the dna of the man with the compound eyes right so i guess like again we've, we've kind of talked to, we've mentioned the kind of future setting science fiction like elements mm. and it's definitely i think looking at this kind of larger or it's connected to this larger this, you know, climate fiction, ecological dystopia, eco-catastrophe, people use different terms to refer to this type of literature focusing really on the humanity's destruction of the earth um, and all of the um, people and creatures living on it. Um, 
And, but I would say the two that I really pull out that I think are quite unique in the way that Wumi is using them are the fantastic and magical realism. Right. So I guess, I don't know, I feel like, I feel like we're getting all jumbled here, but you asked about this idea of the metafictional. And so if I can maybe talk you through a little bit about my thoughts on that, and then that will bring me to my thoughts on the, the man with the compound eye himself, compound eyes, the, you know, the title figure. Mm. And I'll touch on those and I'll touch on kind of what I mean by the fantastic and magical realism in the course of that discussion. Okay. Right. So I definitely think that Wu Ming Yi is exploring the nature of memory, writing, and humanity's fraught relationship with nature. And so we can see this a lot actually in this um, kind of complicated connection between Alice and Atlas, this unlikely friendship, right, that they develop. What I think is so interesting is that, in, you know, it, the novel asks you to kind of suspend your disbelief and believe that in a few weeks, Alice and Atle are able to establish communication when they have no common reference in their language, right? Um, yeah, I thought that was a stretch. But what I, but I do think that the author is doing something really interesting there. So Alice, at the beginning of the book, she's stuck, right? She's in a really dark place. I should maybe make a, give a brief trigger warning or content warning here that um, the character begins the book. She's suicidal yeah. um, at the, you know, kind of dealing or grieving the loss of her husband, Tom, and her son, Toto. So she's just consumed by this and she's kind of constantly checking in with the police and asking, you know, asking about if there's any news about what might've happened to her son. They never recovered a body. So she's still in this awful state of, you know, uncertainty. And actually this is maybe a little bit of a tangent, but I think you can see a lot of similarities to Shang Ling Cao in um, Lu Xun's New Year's Sacrifice. I know you had an episode about Lu Xun way back. I'm not sure if you got into that, but that's a, She's, you know, this is a story so written in the um, in the 1920s, I think. And it's about, you know, it deals with, you know, kind of a widow in this really impoverished Chinese um, village. And she's lost her son. And she's, I think her, I think her son is, is killed by a wolf in the story. And she's just constantly telling the story over and over again to her neighbors about how she lost her son. Clearly, she's clearly traumatized by this. And the neighbors are initially kind of sympathetic, but then she goes on and on and on and they become really harsh and cruel and they're just sick of this, right? They're just, mm. they can't, you know, they don't want to hear about it anymore. And I think we see kind of a similar dynamic with Alice in that she talks about, she calls the police all the time asking for updates. And she even knows that they think that, you know, they're like, this is, this is frustrating or annoying, and then it turns out that Atle is actually the perfect listener because she can talk to him over and over and over again. And he doesn't necessarily understand her language to begin with. So he's very patient and he doesn't mind her telling the story over and over again. And then also, if we, if we see later kind of his outlook towards what is real, what is possible, and how things can be communicated are, is quite different than I think, you know, the characters that Alice interacts with on Taiwan, the, other, the Taiwanese characters or the international characters. Um, and so I really, there's a one passage that I think is really key to this. So when he's, when, when, when Atle is on the, you know, plastic island, he discovers writing and implements and he starts drawing like scenes from his life all over his body. And so there's a passage, right. um, I'm going to give a brief quote. It says, he layered drawing upon drawing like a palimpsest. When the drawings came off in the rain, Atle drew new ones. So for Atle, who, again, this, his society has, doesn't have written language, they're an oral-based tra- uh, tradition. But for Atle, it seems like re- recording and re-recording history in this kind of cyclical way is, in fact, the norm, not the exception, mm-hmm. right? And he's also willing to accept a lot of supernatural events as unremarkable. So in a lot of ways... This kind of willingness to accept multiple versions of the truth and reality, along with his, I guess, like patience um, and willingness to listen to her repeat herself makes him 
the perfect character, the perfect companion for Ella as she's processing her grief and her uncertainty at her husband and her son's loss. And then, of course, we have this breakthrough, right, where she and Toto go to the scene where the hiking accident happened. And then she writes two texts, right, two accounts um, that are both called The Man with the Compound Eye, just to make things more difficult for us to keep track of. So she writes a short version, which is presented as a primary text within the larger text itself, right? These series of four short vignettes that are scattered throughout the second half of the book. And then she also writes a longer novel length version, which I think Wu Ming Yi is kind of playing with us and implying that that might be the novel that we're holding in our hands, right? Mm -hmm. And she describes these two accounts as something that apparently happened, but maybe never did. So he's definitely playing with our understanding of truth and memory and writing and how, you know, how do we know what is real and what is not? And this is of course significant with what we find out about Alice. So I mentioned, I've been mentioning the fantastic a lot as a mode yeah. of, as a kind of a mode of, mode of kind of speculative fiction, right? Some kind of writing that goes beyond realism. So here I'm referring to the, um, the way that the fantastic, this term was used by literary critics, uh, Svetan Todorov. So he, he talks about it as kind of occupying the duration of the uncertainty of whether something that happens is real or imaginary. So I'll give you a brief quote from his um, book on the subject. He says that the fantastic is that hesitation experienced by a person who knows only the laws of nature confronting an apparently supernatural event. So is this real or is this imaginary, right? And the fantastic is this moment in between when you're not quite sure which way it could go. And so I, I, so I think that this becomes that the fantastic is, Wumingi is using the fantastic in the four vignettes uh, the, called The Man with the Compound Eyes, the short version, right? This, these texts that Alice writes, as she said, may have happened, but maybe never did. And it's through these that we learn that Alice is not really a reliable narrator, right? That we find out that her son actually died years before from a snake bite, but she kept him alive through her writings and her actions with, you know, her husband, Tom, kind of playing along as a willing participant. And so like within Alice's short story, these four vignettes, the man with the compound eyes is a fantastic figure. Tom meets him and he never knows, is he real? Am I imagining him? He seems superhuman. He's able to kind of get a glimpse at this um, super, you know, om omnipotent view that he has of the world, but he's not really sure if he's hallucinating or not. So these, if you look at these just four vignettes as a text in themselves, I think it's very much capturing on this mode of the fantastic, this moment of uncertainty. Is this something supernatural or is this something real with a logical explanation, right? Is he just dehydrated and, you know, having, you know, just before he dies has a near-death experience and then that leads him to hallucinate? Or is he actually encountering this mysterious superhuman figure? If you're reading just the vignette, that's, that seems pretty unclear. Mm. And then that, that brings up the question is, well, is this novel really science fiction then if it has this kind of fantasy elements? Um, and again, that depends on how you define science fiction. And I do think that texts like The Man with the Compound Eyes um, can expand our understanding of what sci-fi is. But if going back to the novel's internal continuity, once, once the text presents The Man with the Compound Eyes, these four vignettes as a kind of primary text that Alice has written, then it becomes the vehicle that we see this kind of scientific explanation for why Alice um, experiences the world the way that she does, right? Why she is convinced that her, her son died in a hiking accident when in fact he died, um, you know, several years before from a snake bite. And it gives this whole kind of, you know, this kind of scientific explanation and the way that we see in a lot of sci-fi novels, right? Here's the science behind this, um, you know, unlikely occurrence, right? Mm. And it's explaining, it, it, it's explaining how, you know, 
she was able to kind of convince herself of this alternate version of, of history. And it's particularly through writing, right? She writes in the guidebooks, she writes, um, you know, she writes in, in the diary and she's kind of doing all the things that she would if Toto were alive and writing in all of, you know, um, keeping, keeping up with all of his like insect guidebooks and these catalogs of like these like nature catalogs that he's really into. And so the man with the compound eyes, the character, right? Did he attributes Alice's delusional like memories to the power of writing, which he views as something that's fundamentally human. So I guess ultimately the book positions writing in a very kind of contradictory way, right? It's both preservative because this is something that allows Alice and Tom to keep Toto alive um, in, you know, in their minds, even, even after he's perished. But it's also destructive because he, the man with the compound eye notes that humans are the only species that can use writing to, I think the quote is willfully destroy like other elements of nature and the environment. So this, I think, gets back to what I was saying before about this idea of this ambiguous, contradictory interactions between humanity and the environment. So, and then I guess I would just add that this, this kind of ambiguity about our relation to the environment, as well as ambiguity about memory, about reality, about, hu- about writing and about humans' role in all this is really a part of, I think, the novel's larger message of questioning anthropocentrism. So, right, if you think about why should we center, why should we be focusing strictly on humanity as, you know, the most important denizens of this planet? Why is, why are we privileging humans' perspectives and humans' needs over the needs and perspectives of other species? Sure. Okay. Um, I have a really different take on who this uh, man with compound eyes is tell me it, tell me i want to yeah, know it is going to cycle right back to what you were just saying though so um it's handy so um there were parts of the book where i was interested in like the characters or their stories like um, we go on a bit of a side track side um a divergence at one point and we follow like a, a guy recounting like his i don't know if it's his younger years but some wayward time when like the thing he loved most in life was visiting a massage parlor and he befriended one of the masseuses so like that had a sort of like a, just a sort of kitchen sink social realism that I was into but like I said earlier I wasn't getting so much of a genre fiction like hyper real speculative buzz out of the book until we met the man with compound eyes and then I was like whoa because one one of the genre or like you know the one of the literary styles I like where realism isn't the goal is weird fiction, sort of stuff that's in the uncanny, chilling, just the stuff that will either put a shiver down your spine or have you glued to the page because it's like nothing you've seen. It's like on the, the edge of what our brains are able to process. And a, write, a really good writer can do that just with words. So that's like something I love. And when the uh, man with the compound eyes appears, immediately I was like, I was going from sort of breezing through the paragraphs to rereading them, trying to figure out what's going on here. What is this thing? And the feeling I got from it is that, and I don't know if the text, I don't remember if the text addresses this directly, but my feeling is this is either God or this is a God. This is something, like you said, it has a kind of, um, you said omnipotence. I would say omniscience because his compound eyes. Yeah, that was the word that I was looking for, omniscient. Yeah, because it's not really clear if he is omnipotent because he is unable or refuses to do things more than he actually does things and he it's hard to say if he's omnipresent because he shows up in a physical form but he has these it's compound eyes like flies eyes he has these incredible eyes that are made of millions and millions of images and we don't necessarily know why until i think in the last time he appears there's an amazing description of how if i'm remembering right and i could be wrong correct me if i'm misremembering every one of those little pieces of his compound eyes are seeing like another another life a living thing or they're seeing a part of it's not really clear if it's the forest if he's like omni omniscient in his little domain or if it's all of the island of taiwan or if it's all of life living things on earth i just and the fact that he shows up to observe a character and talk to him 
when he dies and almost guide him through his final breaths. There's a thing where it was very peculiar. Um, this dying character is yawning and the man with the compound eyes tells him something like, by the time you've done your 15th yawn, that's it, you'll be gone. It was um, r- really bizarre, but I got the feeling that we were in the presence of some kind of a, a, a nature god. And it, uh, to me, if that interpretation sort of puts it in dialogue with the Waiowaiwan culture, they have some kind of an island god who also seems to be, you know, not a sort of Abrahamic god who just loves you and looks after you, more of an indifferent sort of nature god. This gets me back to what you were saying, the the, the fact that humans aren't necessarily at the center of things. And in many can, re- religions, the gods themselves don't aren't particularly married to the idea of preserving humankind or placing them at the center of things. It's, it's nature that's at the center of things. But then conversely, the man with the compound eyes is, he's a man. He's a somewhat human shaped figure. So perhaps there is some, you know, maybe there is something to say about the relationship of man, nature, and God or nature gods. Do you have any thoughts about, about that way of looking at the figure? I think that's really interesting. And I think you're really smart to draw the parallels to the, um, I think it's Kabang is the name of the, of the god of the Waiowaiowans. You have this kind of more indifferent figure and this kind of role of, I guess, religion or spirituality is, I think there's definitely some connections there. And thinking about kind of going back to this, this kind of theme of decentering humanity. One thing that with the man with the compound eyes that um, actually, so Daryl Sterk, the translator, also wrote an article about this about this novel, and he was particularly about this figure. And he kind of he 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 likens the man with the compound eyes, um, omniscient is the word, um, perspective with almost with like a cinematic perspective. He uses the word montage in his kind of description of this all seeing. And I think I thought that's really interesting because if we were talking a little bit about the similarities with Waste Tide by Chen Chou Fan, the mainland Chinese sci-fi author that I know you and your uh, listeners have discussed previously, right? There's that, there's a similar, like Chen Chou Fan doing something quite similar with the cyborging technology and being able to kind of observe, you know, everything across their island um, on these like little screens, kind of, you know, all this kind of, you know, all lined up um, in a row and having this perspective in Chen Jiu Fan's case, it's the cyborg, right? That's able to, you know, humanity augmented by technology is able to take this perspective. And where in Wu Mingyi's story, it's this more supernatural figure or a figure that's connected more to nature that is able to take this, this montage perspective, right? Visually, it's, it's very similar, but also they're describing, they're driving at something very similar in that they're kind of pushing beyond our limited human perception just through different vehicles. Yeah, well, it makes sense. Nature and the internet, those are two things that far surpass us humans and two networks we right. just can't extract ourselves from. We can't understand it. Yeah, and we can't. Yeah, it's like the the blind man and the elephant. You can touch a little. Yeah, exactly, but, exactly. Uh, you'll never have the whole thing in your head, for sure. And I, I mean, I don't know about you. I don't fancy moving over to the Sentinel Islands to escape the internet. I'm, 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 I'm not going to be escaping the internet anytime. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or nature, for that matter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that gets us really nicely onto the next question um, about this book in relation to mainland Chinese sci-fi. Actually, and, yeah, go on. I'm sorry. I had one. So I wanted to go, come back to such as before we go on to that, I wanted to touch mm. on kind of magical realism, which relates to your mm. kind of connection you were making with Kabang and the kind of mythical um, supernatural occurrences that the people on the island of Wyo Wyo experience. And so just to remind listeners, so magical realism it's a term that's initially associated with 20th century Latin American literary movement led by figures like Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And it presents kind of magical or supernatural elements in an otherwise realist narrative as ordinary. So right, we're in the fantastic 
these supernatural elements come up and you're not sure if they're real or not. It's this moment of uncertainty and both you as the reader, but also the character is questioning, is this real or is this, is, is, or is this something beyond the laws of nature? In, in the magical real, the characters tend to approach this in a very matter of fact way. And, you know, they're kind of just seamlessly integrated into an otherwise realist narrative. And so as I was reading the novel, I noticed that this magical realist outlook definitely characterizes the Wild Wyoans kind of approach to their relationship with um, their god and their connection to the ocean. But in fact, we, we also, what is so striking, I think, is that even though we see the, a lot of these elements as supernatural and we see the wild Wyoans as seeing it as kind of, you know, very matter of fact, ordinary, normal. In fact, we also see material evidence popping up from other characters' perspectives. So we see the things that the wild Wyoans are considering as just kind of, you know, part of their, um, of their own religion or their own spirituality. We see material evidence evidence of them showing up as kind of strange occurrences that are being interpreted, you know, by other characters, by scientists or by other characters in a different way. So things like the wild Wyoan sperm whale ghosts of the second sons that are kind of following and communicating Atle, right? After, at the end of the book, you know, a pod of them like washes up on the shores of Chile and scientists are, you know, questioning what it is that led to this, um, you know, strange natural phenomenon, right? And similarly, we see the, when Rasala's child is born, right? They say that the child is born with um, like a cetacean tail fin, his legs are conjoined. It is kind of, you know, child is born kind of with the it's actually, it's, it kind of reminded me of a scene in Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude, where a baby is born with a pig's tail, right? Just kind of throwing in this element of, you know, something odd or strange or supernatural. And so I, th- I would say that Wumingyi is tying these kind of magical realist elements, particularly to the Wild Wyoan characters, which is really interesting because on the one hand, he's drawing all kinds of parallels between the wild Wyoming characters and the Taiwanese indigenous um, populations. But at the same time, I think the, he's, he's you know, ascribing the magical realist elements only to the wild Wyoming characters, which is kind of a way of like, having your cake and eating it too, because yeah. magical realism has long been associated with post-colonial and indigenous literatures as kind of a way of challenging, you know, dominant approaches to reality and dominant narratives. But at the same time, there's been some pushback. Is this just kind of exoticizing people who are already exoticized by the colonial, by the colonialist um, outlook, right? Is this a way of kind of infantilizing, um, you know, people in a way that's really only, that's playing into these colonial power structures. So I think by drawing parallels between these indigenous characters, but then really leaning hard into the magical realism only with the the kind of, you know, fictional indigenous group, and then kind of presenting the, the Taiwanese indigenous characters as much more grounded in our world and kind of interested in, you know, incorporating, say, their traditional worldview with more main, what we consider more mainstream or dominant science, right? They're much more um, like, you know, they're kind of able to um, cross over these different boundaries, right? In a way that I think it gives them more complexity than this kind of, these, you know, the Wyoming characters, which could almost be read as like a parody or a, a exaggeration of these kind of, you know, colonialist fantasies of these uncontacted groups, right? So I, I guess I don't, and again, I don't know whether he was successful in this or not in his portrayals of indigenous Taiwanese peoples. I don't know. I can't speak to that. I'm not in a position to speak to that. So in some ways he's able to make connections to this, to Taiwan's history of indigenous literatures. 
and also to the post-colonial and indigenous literatures, the speculative fiction um, internationally more broadly. Mm. But he's also, it seems like he's also avoiding projecting that directly onto the um, Panka and Bunin characters like Hafe and Dahu. So he's making those connections, but he's stopping short, I think, of entirely like romanticizing or exoticizing. Like otherizing. Um, otherizing, exactly. Yeah. Um, the indigenous Taiwanese characters. Yeah, I think if you were um, a reader who just picked up the book, didn't know anything much about Taiwan, like it, it's not, I don't think it's spelled out for you that these are indigenous characters. You might notice that their names don't look so Chinese, but you probably, I think you would pick it up gradually as you went along. Um, right. And something I didn't know so much about, um, I forget if the novel spelled this one out or if my reading did, but it's set on the east coast of Taiwan, which is a less developed sort of region. As I understand it, the north around Taipei, that's one a developed urbanized region there's a there are some I, I really don't know there's some cities in the, the south pole of the island because for anyone who, who really has no idea it's sort of a vertical oval or even rectangle shaped island and i guess the west coast is unsurprisingly it's fairly economically busy because that's facing the chinese mainland but the east coast is i suppose uh, the ecology i su- from what i understand the ecology is a little bit more intact but maybe also a little more under threat from development. And just in terms of the plot, obviously this is this is where the trash island would land. And from what I understood, like the, I don't know, as a percentage of the population, there's a little bit more, there's more indig- indigenous people on that part of the island, I believe. But this is just gl- going off things I remember briefly reading. Right. So I don't have the numbers in front of me, but what I do know that I think the novel quite accurately portrays in its portrayal of environmental destruction is that because of, you know, development and kind of the, um, the economic development, as we were talking about, and the kind of the population growth among the, um, you know, Han Chinese or Han Taiwanese uh, populations in the urban centers, um, that the indigenous groups have often been kind of pushed to the margins, right? They've been, you um, Push to either the mountains or to the kind of coast or to the margins of the cities, um, just as we've, I think we see, right? I think we see in this book what we, what we know from the real world and that we see in literatures from all over the world that everybody's affected by climate change, but some people are more affected than others. And it's the people who are already most marginalized who are bearing the brunt of this destruction. Yeah. So I think the I think that, that that the book is very much capitalizing on that. Again, that's a similarity as well with Chen Xiaofan's novel, right? Where it's the migrant, the poor migrant workers um, who are the ones who are most severely affected by, in that case, it's an influx of e-waste, right? Here it's influx of plastic waste, mm-hmm. but it's, you know, some people are more affected and it's the ones who are already marginalized because of their ethnicity or their class or gender or ability. Yeah. And um, let's take the opportunity to jump over to Waste Height and Chen Chiu Fan. Yeah. Who's got a special place in my heart on this show because he's the only author in the world who ever gave me a high five. Um, so any excuse to bring up Stanley is is very welcome. And here it's very appropriate too. Um, if only because at the end of Waste Tide, yes. we see a little like it's a little bit like a scene at the end credits of a Marvel movie or something. We see a glimpse of a trash island. So like, yes. I guess the, I, I forget if there's an explanation for it, but all the all the trash being sent from the first world to this uh, little, uh, what's it called? Silicon Isle in, in China has, I don't know, trash. Is, I, I, don't, I have no idea. But in any case, he kind of give us, gives us a teaser for the sequel, which he is apparently planning to write. I think now that he's finished his nonfiction book with Kai Fu Lee, this is the one he's going to be working on. It's coming which is, out in September, I think. Oh, right. Damn, it's even sooner than I thought. Um, yeah, so we're going to see another Sinophone Trash Island book, which is pretty great. Yeah. Do you know uh, if there's much about that or is there much so, in advance? Right. So I think in his in the in the like teaser at the end of his epilogue, we see the the 
Trash Island as like another possible site for, you know, cyborgs to pop up, right? Similar to as we see in Silicon Isle. Um, and I asked Chen Shofan about this a few years ago because I, I was looking at these two works in uh, comparison and they came out a couple of years apart from each other. And I asked, I think the way, I think Man the Compound Eyes was released first. And I asked him like, hey, will you, I, this, this little bit at the end, is that, was that like an intentional call out to Wu Ming Yi's novel? Or is it just that you're dealing with similar, is it a coincidence that you're dealing with just similar themes? And I think he said that he wasn't intentionally making the connection to Wu Ming Yi's novel. But again, I do think that they're concerned with a lot of similar themes. You talked about environmentalism and kind of the environmental justice aspect. Um, you've mentioned also kind of this pushing past human-centered perspectives or human-centered narratives. And I also think that, you know, both of these books are very much focused on hybridity, right? So whether it's human-machine hybridity or kind of cultural hybridity or looking at the way that humans interact with nature and also just the way that they play with genre, right? And then also, I think they're both interested in these questions of the local and the global, right? So both of these novels are very much, you know, both of the novels, I'll say both of the authors are very much making connections to, you know, literature and science from all over the world and from a lot of different, you know, just from a lot of different fields. And they're looking at climate change, which of course is a global issue that can only be solved, you know, transnationally, right? Because it, but at the same time, how is it affecting different locations more specifically? And how are the existing power dynamics in our world shaping how climate change affects different groups of people? And I think it's interesting that they're both using islands as these kind of like micro worlds. This is a term um, that um, sci-fi scholar Brian McHale uses, this idea of these kind of self-contained worlds, whether they're islands or spaceships or, um, you know, trains or planes, like in some of the mm, Han Song stories, right. these kind of self-contained worlds that act as a microcosm of our world that by bringing attention to the kind of bounded nature of these spaces are kind of asking us to, I guess, like consider the rules and the, 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 ways that our world works, right? So by looking on a micro scale, how does this self-contained island ecology, how can we extrapolate from that and use that as use that to think about our own much larger world that again, we touched on is kind of unknowable and huge and humans are unable to fully comprehend like the internet, like nature. So by kind of zoning, zooming in on this self-contained island, which again is similar to what a lot of sci-fi works do, right? Sure, yeah. Not just with islands, but like I have spaceships or with. Yeah. Um, a sort of a little space for us to play with uh, the reader or the writer to sort of play with some ideas. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's like the starship societies in Lu- in Leo Sishin's Santi, through your through, through body problem, right? These kind of worlds that are organized according to different principles than mm. our world, or in some cases, similar principles but playing yeah. out in different ways. Yeah, principles, but turn up to 11. Um, there's a couple yeah, parallels I see in Waste Tide and um, Man of the Compound Eyes that are pretty aligned with what you just said. One's the internationalism in the cast. I think something that sets Chil Fan uh, Stan apart from a lot of other mainland Chinese writers I've read is he's um, able to give us a very diverse cast who all appear as human beings and not sort of national types um and also he's pretty yeah he gives us a a chinese american character who is not american or chinese but is chinese american and um i can't think of many others it's weird how few other instances of of that i've seen in mainland chinese lit i've read um so yeah i think they're i mean maybe this is more normal in taiwan just because it's not quite as isolated and um yeah, just the sort of dynamics of Taiwanese lit, this might be more normal, but I see that parallel between these two novels. Um, but the one I wanted to go a bit further with was the near fu- near future crisis, because this is something I'm just really interested in, because 
this is the trajectory of my life. I'm 28. Um, I'm going to live through all of the near future, actually, assuming I survive it. Um, so I think it's good when sci-fi sets itself five, yeah. 10 minutes or years into the future and isn't optimistic to be completely frank. So there's a paragraph from my uh, dissertation which says this, and not every dystopian feature of modern China is unique. China remains divided by urban rural disparities, while global in economic inequality is worsening. Climate change is a local and global threat. Omnipresent internet surveillance has been normalized by both the USA and the PRC. Chen Fan has made this dual point in several interviews that while the same future is coming for all of us, it may have arrived in China first. And forgetting the focus on the PRC there, the idea that you can write a novel that is saying, look, this is the future that's coming for us. Here's where it makes first contact. So like a first contact story where the alien is the world we're going to have to live in. I feel like we've kind of lived through that in the pandemic. You know, bird flu still hasn't hit yet. More things might hit. The day when antibiotics stop working could come in our lifetime. So that's maybe something that I see a lot of value in The uh, Man with the Compound Eyes. Could be a, not a prediction, but a little thought experiment that says, brace yourselves. So I know that's a bit grim, but do you see that too? Yes, definitely. Um, one thing that I find so striking about the book is that it is looking at like it's, it's presenting all these different ways of interacting with nature, right? So besides just the kind of capitalist development driven approach that's gotten us to where we are, we see kind of maybe the, you know, some of the more holistic practices of interacting with nature that we see kind of on, you know, among the, the population, you know, Alice, as well as her indigenous friends who live um, kind of on the, in this East coast village of Taiwan have maybe you know, have a more, you said that the ecology is maybe a little bit more preserved, but that's under threat by the arrival of all the tourists. And then of course the trash vortex. And we also, we, we see somebody like Dahu who's kind of incorporating his traditional knowledge of the forest with, he goes for a degree in, oh, what's the word for a degree in forestry like right. forestry management is it forestry management yeah yeah um and so he's kind of able to and you know initially maybe some of his friends or relatives might laugh at him but he's kind of able to combine those that knowledge in an interesting way where the forest kind of proves the you know one of the safe places that they can all venture to um you know when this crisis happens and then you also have these characters, you have some of the Western scientists who are kind of coming in and trying to study and trying to study the ecology of Taiwan and hoping to kind of from a preservationist. And then you have the Waiowaiowans who have this very, very kind of regimented way of interacting with nature to the point that they're, you know, um, exiling and, um, you know, sentencing like, to death the second sons, right, in order to kind of keep this tenuous balance. And yet, in the end, all of them are like, nobody can stop this catastrophe, right? It completely wipes out the entire island of Wai'o Wai'o. Um, and the coastal ecology and the people who are living on the coast of Taiwan are devastated by the arrival of the trash vortex. And we see all these kind of rippling effects, you know, with the whales washing up in Chile and all other type kind of, you know, this like spreading outwards, right, of these effects. And so I do think that Wu Mingyi is definitely getting at, like you said, kind of starting in Taiwan, maybe, but these are, these are things that we're going, are going to affect all of us. And that's like you said, that's very grim, that's very chilling, but I think it's also- um, It's important. You know, like a way for us to rehearse these types of, speculative fiction as a way to rehearse these types of, scenarios right yeah a simulation um, yeah people yeah that's something that you know many people talk about right kind of one of those things that speculative fiction can do or help us to understand these things that are kind of beyond human understanding so so young chu is a scholar of science fiction and she she wrote a great book do do metaphors dream of literal sleep it's kind of a play on Philip K. Dick's title. You know, do, andro do androids dream of electric, of sheep. electric sheep? And so she, she, she looks at basically 
science fiction as a mode of writing that's able to help us understand what she calls cognitively estranging reference. So basically things that are too hard for us to understand, like nature, like the internet, Mm -hmm. like trauma. And so sci-fi as kind of a way for us to, you know, like, you know, like hyper reality, right? Like realism, but um, yeah, like push out the front pushing beyond realism, right? And helping mm-hmm. us understand these these things that are otherwise beyond our understanding. So I definitely think that um, if you're thinking about this book as a work of sci-fi, it's definitely doing that. But also, I think we can also draw parallels to science fiction as a genre is becoming more and more diverse, and so it's bringing in not just you know more diverse like ethnically or nationally but also different perspectives different traditions right so if you look at something like indigenous futurism um, writers in Canada right indigenous writers are or afrofuturism people are bringing in different traditions and I think it's really important to recognize that these can expand our understanding of science fiction right and so it doesn't have to just look like the kind of golden age authors you know Asimov Clark that that doesn't have to be the only standard by which we judge whether something is science fiction, but there are, you know, bringing in expanding, expanding science fiction to include new voices. It's really important to respect the traditions and the kind of speculative modes that these, that authors are able to bring in that are maybe outside what we would expect to see. Yeah, for sure. The sort of estranging or weird things you can do with literature thing, sort of a metaphor I might think of for that is if you think of, I don't know, some kind of a rubber ring, say that's your mental horizons. If you're reading something truly strange, and I can give you an example from this book. So when Atlai lands on the trash island and he notices that every animal who touches it or eats, nibbles a bit of it, dies. And he looks at it and thinks, am I in hell? So it's a very strange idea of hell, like a man-made island that wipes out all life that you could wash up on on the ocean. So, I mean, yeah, so it's this gives me this really strange feeling that I can't quite put a word to. And so that what the fiction is doing is sort of stretching out, as if you imagine two hands pulling out this ring in directions it's not really made to go in, and which after you let go, it springs right back. But some things after you stretch them, they're that little bit wider, you know? So yeah, it's, it's really, changing. Mm-hmm, it's that's change. a it's, it's there's it's change. That's really interesting. That's yeah. So although you don't notice it incrementally, your mental horizon, if you expanding. throw your mind into this weird zone, um, you might come out with some really interesting things. And you could I don't know if I was going to do a PhD or something, I might look at times when there was a lot of great weird lit in the mainstream. So like what in the seventies we had. Um, Tales of the Unexpected on the TV here in the UK. In America, there was The Twilight Zone. Um, It would be great if we could, and maybe Black Mirror actually in the UK and the US and worldwide was taking us into this sort of, if not always weird, shocking and uncomfortable and mind bending sort of space. And then it becomes a reference point for us. It's something like the idea of living on after you're dead as a something in a big server room full of servers that's something I don't have much trouble grasping now because that was in like a very easily digestible episode of Black Mirror. So yeah, I mean, sure. I'm sure a lot of genres of literature can do this to us, but I think sci-fi and its strange cousins are pretty good at that. Um, Another thing I wanted to mention just briefly before we go into the silly questions, um, you mentioned how he goes for a land management degree and pretty much every episode of the show, I try and shoehorn Scotland in somehow Uh, And actually, I'm finding you can do that with Taiwan quite a lot if you're willing to be a little bit naughty. Um, And like, yeah, land management and a sort of unspoiled green area of the country, that really applies to Scotland because we have the Highlands, which is not just for Scotland itself, but for the UK. That is a massive, massive uh, shelter for a lot of species uh, and just biodiversity and like like l- pollution levels are only really zero in the UK in the highlands um like there's certain lichens you'll only really find in dense, con- dense concentration there so on one hand it's this very pristine zone on the other hand it's a massive tourism zone um it's a playground of the rich from 
I guess, a lot of probably plenty of rich Scottish people, but also the English and the international rich. It's their sort of playground. And it's, um, although we might think of it as natural, I'm pretty sure the whole thing is actually very managed and artificial, optimized in a way to be our green place. And there is a, the main university for the Highlands is it's very sparsely populated. So we have this thing called the University of the Highlands and Islands, which is lots of little, I don't know what you'd, colleges or whatever spread out over Scotland's Western Isles and the Highlands. And if you want to, you'd only really want to go there if you're doing like a land management or a gamekeeping degree. So like on one hand, if you really love nature, that's probably where you'd want to go. But on the other hand, you're not going to be sort of um, helping nature express itself naturally. If you have a land management degree, you're going to be helping it op- op- be optimized and preserved for anthropomorphic purposes, basically, because we're not just going to go and rewild the whole country. <laughs> right. Not right. A rad- it's not a radical green area. I mean, parts of it might be, and it's probably thanks to activism that it's not totally despoiled, but um yeah, the the existence of a land management degree is just an interesting thing of itself. That's I've, a really good point. I have a girlfriend who's in, who uh, is writing a book about uh, wolves in the UK and is very pro rewilding. And I'm sure if she was listening to me talking, she'd come in and grab the mic and correct everything I just said. But yeah, that's that's a whole another podcast episode, I think. Um, so before I th- go on, send us into the more silly misc questions. Is there anything you want to say? No, I think we've covered, I think we've covered most of what I had prepared. Sweet. Okay, cool. So let's, let's um, be a little bit more lighthearted. So um, can you suggest for us a Chinese uh, word of the day that kind of um, would be a good representative for this story? Yeah. So a word that I learned from this story is woliu, which means vortex. Oh, that is good. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to write it. Is that like Wu, W-U, or? Uh, W-O. Oh, Wu Liu. Okay, got it. Wu Liu. Wu Liu Vortex. Yeah. That is yeah. a good word. Liu, like, uh, you know, uh, just like flowing. And then Wu is actually, I, I wasn't familiar with this before, but it has to do with like spiraling water, whirlpool type. Mm, cool. It, it also, you know, they both have the water radical. Oh, excellent. Um, double double yeah. uh, the three, yeah. San Dian Shui. Yeah, or San Dian Shui, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. I'm glad it's like one of the only radicals I know the name for. So that's good. Yeah. Um, okay. Next question. It's if this book was a drink, what would it be? Um, now I should stress if you were really stuck, soft drinks, hard drinks, hot drinks are, are accepted, even a food if you were totally stuck. But I've banned by imperial decree of the sea sages, strong coffees and cocktail mixes of everything because we've had a few of those already. All right. Well, maybe I'm going for a really obvious answer here, but I would say it's a bubble tea. <laughs> There's a whole lot going on. All kinds of things are mixed in, but it's all, I think it's, you know, very Taiwanese, but also very international. Mm. And it probably comes in a big plastic cup with a big plastic straw. <laughs> Perfect. That's funny. I don't think anyone used bubble tea before. Um, oh. So you, you got there first. Yeah. Kind of the obvious answer for Taiwan, I guess. Right. Although I guess it comes in many varieties. So it does. It does. You've not um, kind of conquered the whole the whole zone. Um, next miscellaneous question is a self promo slot, um, or just a chance for you to direct the listeners anywhere to uh, any of your own online presence or work. Where can we point them? So um, I, I I tweet about. Chinese science fiction um, at Kara Healy, C-A-R-A-H-E-A-L-E-Y. Um, and if any readers want to reach out or um, talk, I'm always interested in talking about Chinese literature, Chinese sci-fi, science fiction. Um, so feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or you can email me. Uh, if, if, you, if you Google my name, you'll see my uh, university profile at Wabash College. And um, that's healyc at wabash.edu is my email but again you can find it online and um, in terms of my um, scholarship most of that is behind university paywalls unfortunately the way that scholarship tends to work but um, I have links to that on my website as well cool okay and the very last questions are further reading questions Uh, if our listeners want more where could we point them so I guess we can say right off the bat waist height and most of the works of David Mitchell. Uh, yes. Where else could we point listeners? Um, well, I was just thinking in terms of 
if you're interested in kind of sinophone science fiction, science fiction, then if you look at uh, Ming Wei Song and Ted Huter's anthology, uh -huh. um, The Reincarnated Giant has several um, stories and excerpts. And I guess it's a little bit of self-promotion in here as well. I translated an excerpt from um, Ego Yan Zheng, Ego Yan, um, his novel, The Dream Devourer, uh, which is all about kind of also deals with uh, cyberpunk themes, I would say. And um, I actually, I, th I think that Daryl Sterk also did a translation of another one of Igo Yen's novels, Ground Zero, that was post published online um, just quite recently, a couple months mm. ago. Interesting. And so I'm not sure if he has plans to do the whole work or not, but I would love to see it if he did. Yeah, um, I'll just say for listeners as well, this has got um, a really interesting mix of um, Chinese sci-fi writers in it, this book, The Reincarnated Giant. There's a lot who you guys or Chinese sci-fi fans might know from Ken Liu's anthologies. So like Han Song, Liu Cixin, uh, Xia Jia, Chen Xiufan himself is in there. But yeah, like you said, some other writers from Taiwan and some other, I don't know, what would you say, like rare, harder to find in translation authors like uh, Chu Hui, uh, yeah. Zhao Hai Hong, all sorts of interesting stuff. So yeah, it's, it's a cool book. Um, yeah. And it's got what I would describe as a very funky bright color cover um so yeah one for the like yeah. if you're uh it's a pretty good one if you're like a completionist for your translated chinese sci-fi but as a piece of literature in itself it's got a lot of cool stuff in it so yeah i would second that for the reading recommendation um i don't know if i would like i'm just trying to think which david mitchell book i'd point most frantically towards for this one there's probably two that jump out at me one is the Bone Clocks, which is yes. probably his most like, I don't know what you'd say. I think a lot of li literary, literary, literary types weren't so keen because it had a very sort of fast paced, almost pulpy, exciting plot. Um, it's it's not trying, I think, to be highbrow and literary like Cloud Atlas. I thought it was great. Oh, I, I really think it was enjoyed totally, it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's not a criticism for me. I'm, I try not yeah. to be a snob. Um, but the end of the book, it gets, yes. it goes into like, the rather horrible places where our world could be heading yeah. not just after me and you are long gone but like we follow a woman who's i guess older than both of us and we reach her at the sort of the later years of her life and she's living in a, what you'd call a crap sack world it's all just gone to hell and it's presented quite matter-of-factly um that so yeah book it gives me nightmares still totally. i still think about that years later and it it haunts me yeah yeah um it's it's pretty freaky um and if you want one of his books which has a really strange use of like is this a realist book or are we are we going into the fantasy zone it's called um the thousand summers or th hang on a minute this involves my dutch pronunciation skills which are non-existent so the thousand autumns of jacob de Zuit, or de Zuit, sorry don't speak dutch but that's um that's kind of on an, a pseudo island that's on the dutch like floating port which was allowed to exist by i don't know which japanese Tokugawa, japan right there you go thank you um so it was the one like contact with foreign traders that was allowed and most of the novel happens on the shore or on this floating trade city so there's something there but it's more like the the weird how the weird creeps in around the edges of the book is not entirely different from the man with compound eyes uh, so yeah um those another, are my Go another on. book that deals with a similar similar themes i think is kim stanley robinson's new york 2140 which is looking at you know after you know in, in 2140 new york has been partially flooded and so because of uh, the rising sea level and it looks at the kind of whole cultures and the subcultures that pop up kind of based on this, um, based on this, you know, changed scene, this, this changed city and how humans are able to exist in, um, you know, this kind of on the margins of land and sea and how these things are blurred once the, um, so it's, it's really fascinating. And it's actually, even though it's, you know, dealing with a catastrophe, it's a little bit more, I think, optimistic than um, like the ending of the bone clocks, for example, kind of looking at 
ways that you, you know about at human resilience i guess mm. um i i don't know if you knew this about david mitchell um but a thing that makes the ending of the bone clocks extra like oh my god is that all his novels are in the same continuity yeah so they're all heading yeah. for that shitty future uh, yeah oh god um, right. and then with that and then you get kind of i think it's connected to like the the one of the sections in um, Cloud, Atlas. Cloud Atlas, which is also, I, you know, I think it's set in Hawaii, and it also deals with kind of Pacific Island um, people culture in yeah. a way that, again, I think is maybe kind of operating on that knife's edge of, you know, is it exoticizing? Is it par- is it a parody of something? Is it? Mm-hmm. And then if you watch the movie, you can see Hugh Grant in tribal face paint, which is yeah, and the, all the yellow face in that movie really made me very uncomfortable. Right. And yes. kind of the yeah. I, I saw that they were trying to kind of, you know, play on those parallels, this idea of people kind of, you know, the same like souls showing up in different lifetimes. But I But there was no way that was there was gonna... no way that was going to actually work. <laughs> I think they yeah. Um, it's it's quite unique in that regard let's say yeah um, yeah um okay right enough rambling on um i guess i'm gonna say thank you for having me on the show oh, that's completely the, that's completely <laughs> no, backwards thank you for having me on the show <laughs> That's what I meant to say. I was also going to say it's funny we we went the whole time without using the word anthropocene. Um, That's true. We did present like a ghost, um, but no 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 time for that. Uh, I'll save that for future episodes. But yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, it's been a great chat, and you're welcome back anytime. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, likewise. All right, we've reached the end of the show, so there's not much left for me to do now. Just give you the the plugs. And I think I'll I'll be fairly minimal today with the plugs. So social media. Um, you can find this show social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Discord. Those are where you want to go. Instagram is at Churchufic, T R C H F I C. Twitter, it's just my own one, at Angus Likes Words and Discord. There's an invite Discord link in the show notes. In fact, all those things are are linked in the show notes. So just click on them. They're a good way to give feedback both to myself and to talk to other fans of the show in the case of Discord. If you'd like to support the show, that means with money by the way, there's a buy me a coffee, there's a Patreon with dozens and dozens and dozens of bonus episodes, pretty much as many bonus episodes as there are uh, main feed episodes now. They're generally solo episodes, they're generally roughly about half an hour long, sometimes less, sometimes more, and there is actually two on this book. I did a preliminary thoughts sort of as I was halfway through the book, and then a follow-up post-read thoughts after I'd read the thing. Those are both recorded uh, before this chat I had with Kara. So if you'd like to get a picture of like how I was feeling upon immediately finishing the book, it's up there on Patreon. Well, um, I said I would be brief and I've completely failed, but um, yeah, that that is all. So yeah, thanks again to Kara for coming on the show. It was a fantastic chat. Thank you to you, the listener. And remember, the best thing you can do for the show is spread the word. So this time I'll say, if you meet the man with compound eyes, grab him by his uncanny throat, or, you know, or his hand if you want to be friendly, and tell him, like, mate, use your omniscience to tune in to Angus's podcast, because you could learn a thing or two about Sinophone literature. So yeah, I, I stand by that. Um, until next episode, Zaijian.